The Farkas conjecture was named for Joseph Farkas, 1892 and 1945, a brilliant and eccentric theoretical physicist who fled Munich in 1939, narrowly escaping the perdition of the Nazis. His fate remained a mystery until 1952 when a Swedish naturalist studying the migratory patterns of elk along the Kalaxalbin River came upon the collapsed remains of a small cabin. Beneath the pile of bleached and broken birth, birch logs, the naturalist discovered a brass box containing the journals of Farkas. In them, the scientist had not only described his years of isolation in the Swedish wilderness, but had also laid out the conjecture that has bedeviled the greatest minds of science for more than half a century. In the journal's finally Entry, dated 18th of April, 1945. Farkas indicates that he has found the solution to the problem, but feels before writing it out that he must check the fishing lines he has hung through holes he had cut in the frozen surface of the river. Records indicate that the spring of 1945 was unusually mild in the northern parts of Sweden. It is assumed that Farkas un unintentionally and for eternity joined the fish in the frigid waters of the Calix Alban. One might describe the Farkas conjecture as the Mount Everest of unproven scientific theorems, except that Mount Everest has been scaled <clears throat> countless times and not a soul has come close to standing atop the Farkas conjecture. <clears throat> it has certainly not been for one of trying. Armies of mathematicians and physicians have spent the better part of their lives and careers. Some might even say their sanity trying to discover an approach that will lead them to the summit of this great puzzle of all puzzles. What drives them on is their belief that a solution will lead to unprecedented insights into the nature of the physical world. Insights with rewards that can be scarcely be imagined. Some have claimed that a complete understanding of the conjecture could allow man to control gravity and even manipulate time. <clears throat> Among the most passionate and de dedicated believers in the hidden power of the Farkas conjecture was the father of 13-year-old Alice Randolph. Dr. Julius Randolph was a world-renowned professor of phys physics who had turned his obsession, his quote-unquote Farkas fever, into a family business. He said each of Alice's three other older brothers went to college to earn advanced degrees in math and physics. He then summoned them back to the family home every summer. There, the four of them would spend hours in the professor's Blackboard line study opening the door only to receive pots of coffee from Alice's mother and to receive to release the clouds of chalk dust produced by their incessant calculations. The professor Randolph had pushed his daughter to follow in her brother's footsteps. The child simply did not have a quote unquote head for numbers. What really had her interest, as her father put it, was quote unquote communing with nature. This was true. For a child her age, Alice was unusually content to spend prolonged periods alone, sitting in the backyard, leaning against a tree and gazing into the distance, or strolling through the woods behind the old Randolph home. It was on one of these walks that Alice found herself beside a small stream that ran through the woods near her home. She spotted a bird circling just above a leaf that was carrying 
being carried along in the current, the stream's current. Precariously balanced on the leaf were two caterpillars. Alice knelt beside the water's edge, scaring away the bird and rescuing the two wet and fuzzy creatures. She placed him on a sunlit rock. Once they dried out, they began to move. Alice watched them closely and saw they positioned themselves to perform the letter T. That's strange, Alice thought to herself. And they wiggled around and formed an H. And this was followed by an A and an N until they had spelled out, thank you. Alice lowered herself close to the caterpillars and whispered, you're welcome. They lay perfectly still. Are you all right? Alice asked. They spelled out slowly, very hungry. Of course you are, Alice answered. She gathered up a handful of choice leaves and placed them on the rock. The caterpillars started chewing eagerly. I know why you are so hungry, she told them. It's because you are going to have to make yourself cocoons and turn into butterflies. The instant Alice said this, she felt silly because of course if anyone knew that, that, that sort of thing, it will be caterpillars. They stopped eating and answered politely. Yes, hard to true to believe. True, hard to believe. They paused for a moment. We are not sure we will make it. Alice understood. They certainly had a close call before she rescued them. I can take care of you till you are ready, she told them, and rose to her feet. Will you wait for me until I come back? Caterpillars seemed to confer, and they spelled out, Yes, we are grateful. Alice ran to her house and found an empty glass jar. She poked holes in its lid and hurried back to the rock. Who knew friends were still there? She filled the jar with leaves and set it the sideways on the rock. You'll be safe in here, she told them. The first caterpillar wiggled into the jar and Alice said, I think I'll call you Oscar. As the companion joined them, she said, added, And you will be Alphonse. Alice was very excited to show her family the spelling caterpillars. She knew her brother and father were hard work, but certainly they would want to meet Oscar and Alphonse. When she went into the study, she could tell they were annoyed by her interruption. But look, she said, look what I have. The men gathered around Alice as she opened the jar. Well, it's just a couple of caterpillars, one of her brothers said. Wait, just wait, Alice told them. Oscar and Alphonse wiggled out of the jar and went to the top of the work table that had been covered with sheets of paper bearing endless equations and calculations. The caterpillar stopped moving and Alice spoke to them. Go ahead, spell something. Say hello. She gave them a little nudge with her finger, but they still they just lay there, lifting her tiny heads toward the chalkboards, but otherwise remaining motionless. Alice looked up at her brothers, her father, who had already turned away from resume his work, chalk stick in hand. They can spell. Really, they can. I saw them do it outside. Maybe you should take them out back outside then, her bro oldest brother told her. He picked up the papers and the caterpillars were on and slid them back in the jar. Careful, Alice told him, was taking hold of the jar. Mrs. Randolph appeared at the study door to inform her family that lunch was ready. As the men filed out, Alice held the jar up to her face. I'm very disappointed, she said. She put the jar on the work table and joined her family. From the mealtime conversation, Alice could tell that the morning had not gone well for her brothers and father. What had looked like a promising approach to solving the congestion earlier in the week had turned out to just be another, another dead end. Another Farkas phantom, as her brothers referred to her family's failed attempt. Mrs. Randolph could sense her sons and husbands' frustrations. She suggested they take a break from the work in the, af in the afternoon, but perhaps a long walk would clear their minds. The professor agreed reluctantly, and after finishing lunch, the men took their leave. Alice, through invited though invited to accompany them, declined. She wanted very much to get back to Oscar and Alphonse and find out what they would still spell for her. 
Back in the study, she opened the door. Oscar and Alphonse climbed out. Why didn't you say something when I introduced you? The caterpillar spelled out. Sorry, very shy. Then they lifted their tiny hands once again and stared at the chalkboard. It was full of equations and notes. Oscar and Alphonse seemed to sway back and forth as they took it all in. Finally, they wiggled around, we know. Know what? Alice asked. The answer was their reply. Alice looked at the chalkboard and back at Alphonse and Oscar. To that, she asked in disbelief. The caterpillar began moving. Watch carefully, they spelled out. Alice picked up pencil and paper. Slowly, Asker and Alphonse began forming the straight, same strange mathematical signs and symbols that covered the chalkboard. She dutifully and carefully wrote each one down, filling four full pages. The caterpillar stopped. Is that it? Alice asked. Not yet, they answered. Very tired, very hungry. Alice helped them back in the jar where they immediately began chewing on the leaves. They'd eaten most of what she had put in the jar, so Alice took them outside to get more, returning to the rock where they had dried themselves out. She heaped the leaves onto it. Oscar and Alphonse contentedly munched away. It looked to Alice as if they were growing larger with every bite. <sighs> you wouldn't think writing out signs, symbols, and numbers would make a person tired, but Alice, Alice was exhausted as the caterpillars, and the three of them fell sound asleep. Alice did not wake till she heard a voice calling her name. The sun was getting low in the sky, and Alice looked for Oscar and Alphonse and found that they climbed back in the jar and were still asleep. She heard her name called out again, picked up the jar, and held it for home. When Alice stepped out of the woods into their backyard, she saw two of her brothers hand raised their mouths, calling out for her. When they caught sight of her sister, they excitedly ran to her. Words tumbled out of them. Stroke of genius. Mind-blowing. Cosmic insight. They pulled her out along into the study where her other brother and her mother and her father had just finished filling the chalkboards with the notes Alice had taken from Oscar and Alphonse. Her father turned to Alice and entered the room. He held the notes. There seemed to be tears in his eyes. Alice, 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 why didn't you tell us? Tell you what? She asked. That you... Her father paused, uh, lost for words. That you... That you were working right along with us, but never said a word. He held up the papers high. This is a work of genius. One of her brothers took Alice by the shoulders and looked straight into her eyes. This is the approach we've been struggling to find. This takes us closer than we've ever been, than anyone's ever been. How did you figure this out? Alice is growing uncomfortable for accepting praise for something she did not do. It wasn't me, she answered, and lifted up the jar holding Oscar and Alphonse. It was them. They showed me what to write down. The men were silent. They didn't know whether they were joyous because Alice, the baby of the family, was the most brilliant person they'd ever encountered, or to be worried because she apparently believed that she could communicate with caterpillars. But her father was certain of one thing. As remarkable as Alice's progress and calculations had been, she had stopped just short of proving the conjecture, and there were still some steps to take. He knew those last steps could let, use up another lifetime. If only, the only way to get Alice to keep going was to let her pretend that caterpillars were solving the problem, and that was okay for him. He had spent his life around eccentric and pe peculiar scientists, and he knew how to handle them. So he gently went to his daughter and asked her if she could find daughter friends who might be willing to finish their work. Alice looked in the jar. The overfed caterpillars were sound asleep. <sighs> They're too tired right now, I think, but we can try tomorrow. Her and her father nodded, and her brothers, humoring her, agreed and told her that it was an excellent idea. Alice climbed the stairs of her room, carrying out Oscar and Alphonse. Later, her mother came in to bring a tray of food and tell her how proud her father and brothers were. Alice woke early the next morning. She looked into the jar. Oscar and Alphonse had been eaten through all the leaves and were lying peacefully at the bottom of the jar. She thought they might like some fresh air, so she 
got dressed and went outside and returned to the rock where they first met. She unscrewed the jar and let the caterpillars crawl into her hand. She could see how much larger they had gotten in just the day that she'd, take, she'd taken care of them. They were ready any minute to make, start making cocoons to become what they were meant to be. Butterflies. She knew it was time to send them back. The caterpillars were softly wiggling in her hand. Spelling out goodbye. She helped them climb over the bark of a small tree and watched as they inch, slowly inched their way upward and out of sight.